I, I thought, I didn't prepare it, but I, I thought it would just be nice to remind everybody how, how we've come along in this journey and what we all know. And I guess I just want to point out a few key points about each one of these weeks so that everybody kind of remembers what I think are the key points anyway. So for week one we can just sort of forget about because that was just our introduction. So week two focused on the fact that we believe pulsars, for very good reason, come from uh, the death of massive stars. And in the evolutionary life of a massive star, the, the constant feud between the gravitational pressure inwards and the radiation pressure outwards. In that, in that battle, eventually gravity beats the radiation pressure and the thing collapses, heavier and heavier elements fuse in the core until we make iron, and iron has a special property that if you fuse it, you cannot make energy come out. So the fusion process stops when we hit iron. Gravity continues to collapse the core, and basically this, this uh, energy of the collapse is so great that it create, causes the, the nuclei in the iron itself to mm. break apart to eventually turn into all the particles turn into neutrons, all the, all the positive charge of the protons get sent into positrons, and we make neutrinos, and eventually we end up with a ball of neutrons, and these neutrons are obey the Pauli exclusion principle, they are fermions, they obey the laws of quantum mechanics, and quantum mechanics tells you that certain things need to be quantized, and so that quantization, that, that Quantization of nature means that the neutrons themselves cannot be infinitely densely packed. They have to have certain spaces between them that space quanta, and that means you cannot press them beyond that. That is called uh, degeneracy pressure, and that stops the collapse, and that's how you end up with a densely packed ball of neutrons. That was, that was week uh, two. Week three, you heard all the awesome business about the rotating magnetic fields, how these rotating magnetic fields create electric fields and they also create pairs, particles, copious pairs of electrons and positrons that fill a cloud and this cloud co-rotates with the pulsar making what we call the pulsar magnetosphere and it's acceleration processes in the pulsar magnetosphere that make the radio beam which you believe comes out along the pole where the magnetic field lines are collinear right at the top of the pole that collinear magnetic field means that the particles that are accelerated in that region all move in the same direction and have coherent motion, which allows us to make the coherent, the coherent radio emission. Whereas outside, high, in higher altitudes, you can have individual particles shooting off, individual X-ray photons or gamma ray photons, and they have to happen at high altitudes because if you have a gamma ray of high energy, close to a magnetic field, it wants to bump into the magnetic field and make a pair, and therefore not escape. So if you want to make gamma rays and have them escape, you have to make them high up. But if you make them high up, the magnetic field lines are bent, and the positrons move in one direction along them, and the electrons move in a different direction along them. So you have very wide beams at high altitudes, and that's why we see the gamma ray pulses aren't these short little pulses like they are in radio, but they have weird structure. They can be two peaks, three peaks, a bridge, all of these things. So this sort of shape of the peak is caused by the fact that they happen at high altitudes where the beams are wide. Pulsars meet Einstein. We're kind of meeting Einstein again today, so I, I won't really talk too much about that because we're going to review some of that today. Yeah. Weirdos you heard about magnetars, uh, which are pulsars that have very, very strong magnetic fields, and the emission from magnetars is not caused by the rotation, but by, by changes in the configuration of the magnetic field. So you don't get like a pulse, pulse, pulse. They kind of are steady, slowly rotating, and eventually they have sort of a, a, a magnetic event that sort of causes a magnetic field to shift, and then we get this crazy burst of gamma rays, and this even impacted our own atmosphere once a decade or so when these soft gamma ray repeaters or magnetars have these bursts. The amount of the gamma rays that comes from them and rains down on our atmosphere even actually affects the depth of the ionosphere in our atmosphere. And that was that that has now been used as a way to study these these types of gamma rays. If there's enough of them, you can actually use the atmosphere as a detector. Before I talk about weirdest two, I'll remind you that in the gamma ray 
pulsar revolution, which we did last week, I also described how we use the atmosphere as our detector at Veritas, that gamma rays cannot, gamma rays of high energy cannot pass through the atmosphere without interacting. So there's no way we can set up a telescope on the ground and see them. If we want to see them, we have to go to space, but putting something, a big collecting object in space that has enough mass to stop the gamma ray and contain it, that's a very, very heavy satellite and that's very, very expensive. So it's much better if you can see the gamma ray interact somehow in the atmosphere and use the atmosphere as part of your detector, which is what I work on at Veritas. Weirdos 2 uh, was, we talked about the weird individual pulses, how the single pulse itself looks rather odd, and you can have various phenomena such as giant radio pulses, this behavior of nulling where the radio pulse are for whatever reason just stops in one rotation, it just stops emitting, and then later on we'll just turn back on again. And, and this is sort of the conundrum of the radio emission that we don't quite understand. And now today, eventually today, we're going to talk about building a gravitational wave observatory from pulsars. So this is, this is very cool and very um, hot right now in the field. This is, this is an area of very active research. And when, in, week, in, uh, in week four, when we talked about how pulsars meet Einstein, what I described to you was that we saw, well, maybe, maybe let's, let's, let's get on with it, actually. We, we can see all this as we get along. So, again, I apologize for the small form factor of the image. I had a yeah, freak out with the computer. So what makes a gravitational wave? So I said to my wife the other day, I'm going to talk about gravitational waves. And she's gravitational waves. Like, she totally doesn't buy it at all. Like, she's very like, ah, it's at all. <laughs> And so I try very carefully, I try to explain, but then she fell asleep, and so, you know. And that really happened. That's, that's I swear to God. I was telling her what a gravitational wave was, and she fell asleep. Um, and so what, what, the way Einstein would have said it was that mass tells space-time how to curve, and space-time tells mass how to move. And so if you can imagine uh, this as a heavy object with a smaller object in it, it sees this curved space-time, and therefore it knows how to move around. Now, if you have an accelerating mass, if you have a mass that accelerates, then it creates a ripple in space-time. And that ripple moves outwards at the speed of light, and that's a gravitational wave. And it's kind of like, you, you can think of the, again, some people find this useful and others don't. So if you don't like this kind of analogy, then just ignore it. But some people can think about the, uh, the current space-time as sort of an information um, surface. And it's informing everything in the neighborhood that I'm a massive body, and if I'm a massive body, then you have to orbit me. And if that massive body gets accelerated and has to move, that information takes time to be reached to another mass. The, the other mass doesn't know right away that the massive body has moved. And so that sort of propagation of, of the information that I've moved is carried through the curvature of space-time in this wave. And that's a gravitational wave. Now next week I should say that we're going to have a real gravitational, as a guest lecture, we're going to have a real gravitational wave expert talking to you. So anything that you're dissatisfied with of my descriptions, you can ask him and I'm sure he will do a much better job. <laughs> now, I had this, we've seen this picture before. Um, so here's now where you have to use your imagination. Um, because of the failure of the laptop, we, this was a picture of the binary pulsar, the one that won the Nobel Prize, and we had one pulsar orbiting what is certainly a neutron star, and as it orbited around, your, uh, the, the space-time sort of rippled outwards, and this was a movie of the rippling outwards. And it was this rippling outwards of the, of the gravitational waves that causes the in-spiral of this pair of, of uh, neutron stars, and that's why that's why the Mercury, the perihelion of Mercury is advanced. That's why it's advanced than where we expect it to be because gravitational waves are being lost by Mercury, but that's only a tiny amount of, of, uh, of its orbit per century, whereas this is a visible four degree thing per year. And so, yeah, this was the two of them orbiting around, and over the course of 250 million years, this thing would spiral in uh, and change like four. I guess it's about a third or a fourth of its size. Um, yeah. 
come on, if I hate yourself. Oh, so this was another movie just to help you visualize the flowing outwards of the gravitational wave, but yeah, unfortunately, I can't get it to work. And so this is what exactly what I said. Well, gravitational waves are lost by this system. And so this is uh, how, what Einstein said should have happened. Uh, and this is what uh, Newton said should have happened. So this is like a cumulative delay, uh, change in the periastron. So as, as, uh, as one orbits around the other, its sort of orbit actually processes around. And so this, this angular advance here is, is 4.2 degrees per year. And this happens because the system is losing energy through gravitational waves. Now, how is it that we're able to do this? So I never actually got into the details of how we actually time pulsars. I've just said pulsars, they come down, we have a telescope, we see the beep, and everybody goes home. You know? But that's not, that's not quite uh, as, as easy as it is. It's, it's actually rather complicated, but also kind of cool. And so, in order to detect gravitational waves with pulsars, like in week four where we saw they were indirectly detected by the decay of the orbit of the binary pulsar, and how I'm going to talk about how we, do, we can try to directly detect them, uh, we need to be able to time pulsars very precisely over long periods of time. This is not something you can do five minutes, beep, 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 and go home. This is something that takes 10 years, 20 years of very precise timing in order to see these signals. So if you're going to do that, what do you have to do? So you, you have to deal with an equation that looks like this. And this is a, it's going to get nastier, but I promise you'll all find it fascinating uh, when we get into it. Um, so the, these are different terms in the equation. And this is a, the time that we will use. Uh, this is the time that you measure at your telescope. So the thing you actually write to your disk or write down in your logbook in the old days, the time you measure at the telescope. This is just some reference epoch. We don't need to worry about that. Everybody agrees. At some point, you know, we'll start the clock now, and every time is me measured relative to that. This is called the clock correction. And then there's going to be a dispersion correction, something called the Romer delay. I don't know why he gets to have a delay, but he does. But the Romer delay. Then something called the Einstein delay, and also the Shapiro delay. And again, I don't think he, will, he should have one. It really should be called the Einstein delay part two. But uh, there you go. So what is the, uh, the, so this is a very simple. This is literally the time, the, the time stamp that you record on your clock at your telescope. This is a picture of the Green Bank Radio Telescope in Virginia. Uh, and, and yes, we all have agreed sometime in the past uh, what our reference time was. Now, what's this clock correction? So let's say people who are working on this telescope happen to know some particular little nuance about this clock. You know, it, we know it has a standard offset from everybody else's. And the, you know, they, these, are comp these, uh, these high time resolution clocks are quite uh, um, delicate little creatures. They don't, uh, you don't just make a production line and spit them out. They, they are very uh, delicate, and so sometimes they have their own personality. <coughs> and so you, you, you have to encode that little personality in what's called uh, your clock correction. But there's also other things that need to be accounted for. And th these other things sometimes make the news, which are called leap seconds. So I don't know if anybody ever heard of a leap second, but the Daily Telegraph tells you that the French time lords have added one second to 2015. So there is, there is a, uh, a situation where we believe our, our atomic clocks are measuring a second precisely, and so there. Um, so when you measure time, when anybody measures time, what they really are, what they really want, what you really want to measure time is something that repeats itself all the time. Like so, there's some atom in an atomic clock, some cesium atom in an atomic clock that does a kajillion wiggles every second, and we're like, okay, when we see a kajillion wiggles of the, of the clock, then we that's one second. And so the thing that's wiggling is this uh, cesium atom. Mm -hmm. Now, in the old days, when we started you know, thinking about things, thousands of years ago, the thing that was most reproducible was the sun rising and falling. And so we, we decided our unit of time is the day. Everything happens in the day. Now, of course, the day is not a constant thing because our Earth has uh, irregularities. It has earthquakes. It has seismic shifts. It has certain geological things that slow its rotation. And so if you want the number of seconds in the day 
to be the exact same as the time it takes on average for the sun to rise and fall. Then every now and again, so if you want to look at if you wanted to look at your clock and say it's 12 noon and it really is 12 noon, and that clock ticks by seconds, but noon ticks by the earth and its and its mass and all its jiggling around with geology and whatnot, then every now and again you have to add in a little second in order to keep noon at noon. So th th when when this happens, so th this is a there's some website where you can look at what the U.S. government says what time it is, and somebody took a, a screen grab. So that's how they handled it. They gave a they let they let it go to 60 instead of 59, and that was in special like second. Last sentence there. Le leap second lovers. Our trainer says, yeah, yeah, why not? <laughs> <laughs> so so this is another thing that people and and these get added uh, on December. 31st and on June 30th, uh, when they need to be. So when the French Time Lords decide, oh, it's time, it's time for one, then they they sneak it in at that particular time. And now there's a there's a lot of people giving out about this because people have now loads of computers, and you know if those computers aren't updated, then they think it's a different time. And so if you're doing high frequency trading, you'll have a you know. Anyway, that's that's all. That's all. Who knows? The leap second is on thin ice, I would say. Now, another thing is, is this what's called the dispersion measure, or the dispersion correction. So one thing I maybe have alluded to uh, throughout the lectures, but I haven't explicitly shown you, is the fact that light, uh, well, you, you should all notice, everybody should notice by now, that light only travels at the speed C in a vacuum. And space is not a vacuum. Space is filled with stuff, electrons, gas, molecules of stuff, who knows. And so. Because uh, light only travels at the speed of light in a vacuum, it is affected by the medium in between it. And how much it's affected is frequency dependent. Now this shouldn't, this shouldn't uh, surprise you because we see it happening right here. Here's light traveling in air, and here's light traveling in whatever material this is, glass or whatever. And its frequency, the, the speed that the, that the light travels in this uh, medium is different, and so it causes uh, basically the red light to get ahead of the blue light or whatever, however you want to describe it, and this is how we end up with a rainbow. It's because the speed of light is different in different media, mediums. So radio wave is just a light wave, and space is just a medium that has, you know, tenuous material in it, gas, whatnot. So radio travels at different speed. And so here's how a single pulse from a pulsar would look. So I, I don't know which pulsar this is, but this is just uh, how I have been showing it to you, but uh, the, the real truth is that if you have your frequency uh, response of your instrument, so our, the instrument that is measuring this doesn't just listen to one frequency, it listens to a whole range of frequencies from say 12,000, so 1.2 gigahertz to 1.5 gigahertz, and so each one of those uh, little channels sees the pulse arrive at a slightly different time. But we, we can correct for this. this, this is when you, you exactly see this, this pulse arrive at uh, So when did it really arrive? Like, when did it arrive? It depends on what frequency it was at. And so what you do is you measure how it changes, you measure how it changes the frequency, and that's a, a if you have a, a high frequency, if you have a high bandwidth like this where you can measure a lot of frequencies, you can easily characterize how much uh, the intervening space is delaying your signals, and so you can make a correction and push it to infinite frequency. So that, that's a term that means that the higher you are, the more energetic you are, the less you care about the stuff in between. So a gamma ray doesn't have this problem. If there's a few blobs of, of uh, electrons in its path as it travels across space, it doesn't care. But radio does. And so we basically me measure this effect and then sort of translate it to what what time it would have arrived if it had infinite frequency. But that's literally just measuring this curve, and you see it even wraps around. Like this actually kind of goes down this way. So you measure this curve, and then you correct it, and you shift it to infinite frequency. And so that's the, that's the dispersion measure correction. Now these guys you're all familiar with. You already saw, OK, all right, all right, here we go. If you know the density, this is a cool thing about pulsars. If you have somehow know the density of electrons along the pulsar line of sight, you can get a crude estimate of the distance. And distance is really difficult to measure in astronomy. So pulsars are great because they give you distance with sort of an error mark. 
And whereas a lot of objects, it's, it's, it's rather difficult to measure how far away they are. So pulsars are also incredibly useful because of this dispersion effect that allows you to measure distance. Now, the rover that I, yeah, I don't know what he has in mind, but he has. So this is basically the, um, the fact that the Earth is moving, and we don't, want, uh, we don't want the fact that our clock, the clock that's measuring them happens to be whizzing around. We, don't, we want to take that out. So what we do is we, we say, OK, if there's a pulsar over here, and, and the light coming from the pulsar would have landed at the SSB, that's called the Solar System Barrier Center, which is the center of mass of the solar system, which isn't quite the center of the sun, even though the sun is the heaviest thing. The other objects in the solar system actually make the center of mass of the solar system slightly offset from the center of the sun. And that, that place is called the solar system barrier center. And so we say, OK, if, if light was coming to this, the thing that doesn't move around, the, cent the center of mass isn't around, doesn't, doesn't move around. If light was coming in from the pulsar and it arrives at this time, how, how long would it have uh, taken to arrive at the Earth? And that, of course, depends on you know, what, what season it is, uh, what, what time of year it is, so where we are on this circle, and also where the pulsar is. For example, if the pulsar is way out there, perpendicular to the screen, then this is essentially not an effect at all, because, because we are coplanar with the solar system barrier center with respect to the incoming photons. So depending on where the pulsar is and where we are on the time of year, you have to apply a correction. Hmm. Called the Romer collection, and that's the classical, that's the classical correct collection, correction for that. Now, of course, all right. So that's what I just said. Now, of course, I all told you in week four about how time behaves differently around different mass objects of different mass, and so we all remember this, the Carol Alley's experiment of how he put a clock in a plane high above the, the Earth for 15 hours, and this clock ticked a little faster than this clock down here. So the, in order to obey the speed of light, in order to obey the speed of light, the light that's coming in to the Earth knows that there's a mass of body in the Sun, or even Jupiter, if Jupiter happens to be up here, say. It knows that it's passing by a mass of body, and so it must change its speed in order to obey the speed of light, because the clock, the clock the local clock is traveling at a tick slower. And yet, this is, I probably could say this a hundred times, and people will be like, ah, how does this happen? And all I can tell you is that you have to go back and look at the lecture where I spent a whole hour convincing you of this fact. <laughs> and now you've forgotten it, and it seems unsavory, but it's true. Um, and so there we go. We have to account for the fact that uh, if for, and this effect will be different if the pulsar was over here. If the pulsar was over here coming in, then it wouldn't have grazed the sun or passed close to the sun. And so this effect also depends on where we're looking. Mm -hmm. uh, and also, as I said, if, if Jupiter is out here, Jupiter can also have an effect, a measurable effect. Which means we, we can also use pulsars to measure very accurately the mass of Jupiter, just on the side. Um, and now the Shapiro delay. And this is basically uh, another effect caused by, uh, caused by general relativity, which is that the actual path is also not straight. It's curved. And so it does take some time to traverse that curve. And, uh, and this is called the Shapiro delay. And uh, we saw this in the, in, the, in the binary pulsar, that one pulsar was traveling path behind the other one. So we saw this Shapiro delay happening in a binary pulsar system where the pulsar is, is is going behind its companion, and we would see this characteristic delay. And so this is also happening uh, in our own solar system, but we have to account for that. But we all we believe Einstein. We scribble down everything that that uh, is supposed to happen, and we can account for all those effects, and therefore measure what's the real time. So what is the real time that a photon would have arrived in the solar system Barry Center right now? In the, and, and that takes into account that tomorrow, if we're in a different car, well, not tomorrow, but sometime later when we measure the pulsar and we're in a different place in our orbit, in a different place relative to everything, that all those corrections will still make our kind of reference frame stay set the same. Our reference, we don't want our time of our way of measuring stuff, our particular recipe of measuring stuff to change. We want it to stay the same. And so in order to get it to stay the same, we have to uh, account for all the changes that are happening to our poor clock. Our poor clock is shoveling around. That has an effect on the clock, and we have to take those effects out. 
So now you all know how to do it, and it's not quite that simple because if we're measuring a binary system, we have to account for all these effects that I just described. We have to account for those effects in the binary system as well, and we can do that. Then there are the other effects, which is that the orbit decays and the, the angle of periastron uh, changes as well. Uh, this is the GOR effects that happen in the binary. So we have those effects to take into account, uh, which, which account for this. We, don't want, we, we, want our, uh, we want to account for this, and if we didn't uh, include these terms, we couldn't account for this effect. And then there's also the fact that the spin frequency changes. So we have the frequency of the pulsar, the spin frequency of the pulsar, and maybe the higher order derivatives. And so we have all of these terms to take into account, and this is our timing model. And we have, to measure, we have to, over a long period of time of measuring a pulsar and, and looking for any behavior of the pulsar that's different from our timing model, then we can refine these numbers to account for that. So we basically come up with our timing model, then we time the pulsar, and if a pulsar arrives at a time that we're not expecting, then we can ask ourselves, oh, which one of these has a digit that needs to be changed? Maybe it's a 0.6 instead of a 0.61 or whatever. And so, at a given time with our timing model, you can predict when the next pulse will arrive from a pulsar. And so this is how one of these timing models will look, and you don't have to look at it, it's just, uh, these are all how accurately we can measure all these things uh, for a given uh, pulsar. And this is how you're, so this is now, this is, the, this is the business, this is the goods now, you're seeing. So, what I have plotted here, is a, is a good timing model, the good timing model. <laughs> it's 11 years of measuring a pulsar probably twice a month. And what, what's measured here is the residual in milliseconds. So this is the difference in time between when your model said the pulse should arrive and when the pulse actually arrived. And so if you have flat residuals, so residuals that have a little bit of scatter, that's just the way the world is, a little bit of scatter, but they scatter around zero, and then that is a good timing model. Now, if you had a bad timing model, you might get something like this. And if you saw something like this, as you measure it over time, the thing, the residuals, is gradually growing and growing, then you would know that you have an error in your P dot. That's your error in the slowdown of the pulsar. That's how you would, that's in fact, how you measure the slowdown of the pulsar, by finding this residual and then correcting that P dot term to the actual value. So this is how we would measure the spin, uh, the slowdown of the period of a pulsar. And uh, we need to account for that. Uh, and so if you had an error in your P dot, if your P dot wasn't properly measured, you would see this effect. Here's another effect. This is an error in the pulsar position. So you'll see that there's 11 wiggles up and down here. And this is basically because if we have gone around the, uh, we've gone around the solar system. Our clock has gone around the solar system barycenter 11 times, and we are taking, you know, we have an effect that's sort of, uh, we are implanting a, a, a yearly modulation into our signal, and we have to take that out. And so, if our pulsar position, if we, if we believed our pulsar position was in some other place, like if the rays were coming in this way instead of coming in this way, then we would when we would try to take out that modulation, we would actually insert the modulation. And so if our, if, our, um, if our position is not perfectly correct, then we would end up with a modulation that looks like this. So this is, this is a signal that tells us our position. And so here's another thing. By looking at this, we can measure the position of pulsars incredibly accurately. Because if we have any error in its position, it will show up in the time. It's awesome. All right. What about this? This one I didn't put in, uh, a, uh, a descriptor down because I was hoping someone in the audience would tell me what's happening here. Now I'm going to give you a little time to think about it. There's, there's 11 peaks, so it happens, happens on the yearly time scales. The effect is to do with that. The effect is to do with the, the position. Spin down rate error. No, the spin down rate error would just continue to grow. All right. Don't feel bad. This, oh, someone said distance. That's close. Almost there. 
Okay, I would have guessed it, so don't feel bad. This is the, if the pulsar is moving. And we know that they move. We saw this picture, uh, you know, uh, uh, a couple of weeks ago. We saw that the pulsar was made here. This was called the Guitar Nebula. That it was made here in a supernova. And something about the explosion of the supernova imparted some energy into the neutron star and it got kicked out. This is called a kick. And it's whizzing across the sky. And so, of course, if it's time depends on us knowing the precise position, but its position happens to be changing, then we have to account for what's called the proper motion. Mm -hmm. So here's, here's the signal of the proper motion being wrong. Mm -hmm. But we can do this. This is, while this might seem like, oh my god, you've got to get the slow down and the Einstein delay and the Shapiro delay, but this is the bread and butter of, of pulsar timers. This is a solved problem. And what's cool about it is each one of those terms each one of those terms has a signature. So when you see, if you are timing your pulsar and, and it starts to have a, an, a solitary, an a solitary wave that looks like this, and you know it's, it's uh, you know which term in your big long timing model is wrong, needs refinement, and that's how you can have these incredibly accurately measured uh, um, parameters in your timing model. So what if you have a wall? The, the, there is them all. You have them all. You do have them all. And you can pick out each one? You can pick out each one because each one will impart a particular signature in the residuals. The, residu re the signatures aren't redundant. They all are slightly uh, out of sync with each other, so yeah, you can pick out. Thank you. Right. Have, have you demonstrated each parameter? Uh, I haven't got a nice plot to demonstrate. What do you... What? Well, I mean, are the... Each parameter is demonstrable. I mean, are there anomalies for each parameter? Um, so, so there can be. So, each parameter. So, basically, there are some pulsars that are not good timers because they have effects that we don't like, that we haven't accounted for in our timing model. For example, yep. there are some binary pulsars whose companion is a, a big windy star and it, it has its own stellar astrophysics going on. And every now and again, it'll have its own solar wind that it'll like spit out. And so by spitting that out, the, the companion will do a couple of things. It will change its mass a little bit, because it, some of its mass is getting spat out. It will introduce scattering uh, material to the radio beam, because the radio beam is traveling through space and it's gonna see, it's gonna see whatever wind it's going through. And so the, maybe, uh, it, you know, the more uh, material that gets spat out, the harder time the radio beam has getting through it and getting seen, and it might in part terms in the dispersion measure, different terms in the dispersion measure, because I told you the dispersion measure is about how stuff propagates through space, and on an, any given day, the sort of average electron density across intergalactic spa or galactic space is pretty stable, but if you have a nearby star that's whizzing at you all the time, then you can have effects in that. And so stars that have a binary companion, for example, and especially a binary companion that's very close to the pulsar, that can create timing anomalies that we don't account for there. And so we wouldn't use those guys to do gravitational wave studies. Clean, we have enough of them, but we have enough clean, well-behaved systems that don't have anomalies due to the sort of astrophysics. I am going to continue. We, we can, I'm sorry to put you off, but I overheard people talking about how they have to leave, and I've already spent 10 minutes monkeying around with the laptop, so I don't want to, I want to finish things and then we can go into the question period. So what makes gravitational waves? Mm -hmm. So now we've moved away from how we get our awesome, how we get our clocks in space. All the things we have to do on Earth to make our clocks in space behave, kick as we expect. So what makes gravitational waves? So, um, so one of the things you all saw uh, already in week four was a binary neutron star. And so just to keep it through, this was again a nice video with uh, it turning around and ripples coming off. Uh, so this is separate, so this is, remember as well, it's, it's on a, it's rather uh, elongated uh, ellipse. So it, it moves in and out from about that distance, what is 700,000 kilometers to 3 million kilometers. It has an orbital period of three and a half, sorry, seven and a half hours. And of course, we're dealing with two things that are heavier than the sun. Both of them are about 1.4 solar masses. So these two objects 
are spinning out gravitational waves. What else? So binary galaxies. So if you have two galaxies that are spiraling around each other, they will make gravitational waves. Now, while, while we have this slide up, this is a slide I made for other purposes, but uh, it, it works in this context too. I, I, the reason I have it up is because active galaxies make gamma rays, and gamma rays is what I work on, but I don't know if people know about active galaxies, but when people look at galaxies, they see, you know, oh, this familiar, you know, bulge and maybe a spiral uh, shape, you know, and it's all lovely. But some galaxies look like this. And what's happening here is that what happens in that small dot right there is all that stuff. The standard galaxy thing is happening inside that dot, we can't see it, but the galaxy is shooting out these mega jets. Like, <laughs> it's shocking, it's shocking. There's like a cannon of material being spat out like unbelievably and eventually it collides into uh, the material of the, you know, the material of, of extragalactic space finally stops it and we get this lobe. So, so what makes a galaxy shoot out a mega jet? Uh, and here's another one, M87. The galaxy action, all the spiral arms and all that good stuff is happening in here. But we have this like laser-like beam just shooting out. This is a, a very nearby, and you can, so in this one, this one is so nearby that we can actually see the galaxy part and then the jet parts coming out. And this is, this is because at the center of the, of the galaxy there's a black hole, and the black hole is a, has the galaxy basically swirling into it. It creates this, what's called an accretion disk, a swirling accretion disk. And the material, I mean the charged material, so you can think of this as like charges going around because mm -hmm. any charged material that's in this accretion disk is going around. So you can just think of this as a disk of current that's moving around. And that disk of current makes a twisted magnetic cannon, a magnetic column that comes out from it, and that's called a jet. And so this is a cool picture of binary active galaxies. Mm -hmm. So this is two galaxies. The galaxy action is happening in here, and then this is the jets coming out. There's a, you can't see it so great, but you can see the, the fourth uh, jet coming out of this uh, other guy. This is a different picture overlay. So here we have two, essentially the same as the two pole stars, like the two neutron stars that we had that orbit each other every eight hours. Okay, this is, but this is a giant version of that. The black holes are, are, and the, sorry, so the, the neutron stars have 1.4 solar masses. This is 10 to the 7 to 10 to the 9 solar masses, so, you know, the million, billion solar mass uh, objects here. But the orbital period is also a lot longer. Instead of 8 hours, it's 10 to the 8 years. And the separation distance is much larger. But still, this object is doing exactly the same, uh, spiraling in. It is over a long period of time spiraling in. Those, those two, particularly the two uh, black holes at the center, are, are on their way to spiraling in together. It just takes a long time. But that spiraling in, that will make gravitational waves. And this is another example, it's not as pretty as, well, maybe it is, but this is just, just, just a confidence building plot. Another one <laughs> to prove that there, this, there's plenty of them. With the frequency of the wave is related to the... No. No, well, we can talk about that in the question time. Okay. So now, which is a great shame, which is I had a, a movie. Oh, well, let, let, all right, let me let me be brave. This might break. Uh, uh, let's go for it. There we go. <laughs> oh, why are you over there? Come on, buddy. Are you going? No? Okay, so this is supposed to be our, uh, our, this is our, what I just described, our galaxies. And this is now the gravitational waves. So this is the, the curvature of space-time of the two massive black holes and the gravitational waves are coming out from these spiraling black holes. So this is a... 
picture of what, what that's supposed to look like. Now, let's move on. Now, what else makes gravitational waves is mergers. So if the two things spiraling around, you can imagine the potential energy of the system. The potential energy of these, are, is, uh, as they spiral around, is decreasing. And that decay in potential energy is what is causing the ripples of, of uh, gravitational waves. Also, when they collide, when you take two masses and they collide, that collision can also create gravitational waves. And so this is, uh, this is just, uh, well, we have, we have never seen one of these mergers, but, but ev evidence tells us through simulations, this is some simulations of, of galaxies merging, and this is a, an artist's cartoon of two neutron stars merging, and we all know that eventually our, our binary pulsar that won the Nobel Prize is, for around 250 million years is going to, you know, merge. So, um, so mergers will also create uh, gravitational waves, and next week, I believe Ben is going to talk much more about this uh, kind of thing. So, what we can write, what we can kind of, we can make a graph of what makes gravitational waves. And on this graph, we can sort of put what is the gravitational wave frequency? That is, what is the wave length of the wave? And then we can, this is kind of like what is the amplitude of the wave. Now, it's not quite an, it, it's called a gravitational wave strength, but you can think of it as being like the amplitude. How big is the wave? And how long is the wave? And so, so our, uh, our orbiting supermassive black holes have, have the highest amplitude waves. The waves are high, but it takes a long time for a wave to pass. The wave is so uh, long that we it, it's, uh, it passes by. It's, uh, to get a whole wavelength past us takes, what do I have right here, three years. So a, a wave that comes off is, so now this isn't related to the fact that, so this is what, I, what you said. Yeah. It's not that this thing spirals around in, in three years and so the wavelength is three years. And you, you, you can imagine, well, I mean, I was thinking about this, how can I explain this? Imagine a pond, a nice flat, glassy pond of water, and you uh, put your fingers in and you moved your fingers around. Now, do you think the length of the wave, the rate that comes out, will have anything to do with the size, particularly the size of your fingers, or how, no, well, not the size, but how fast your fingers are moving around? Like, if you're moving your fingers around, do you imagine that if I move my fingers around fast, the waves are going to, you know, go up and down, or they're all going to have kind of the same so, so this is so. Don't confuse the binary period with the period of the gravitational wave. That's mainly what I wanted to say. Maybe my pond analogy was not so well thought out. I was packing all week, so I get a free pass on that one. Um, and so, yeah. So this wave that we would like to see from an orbiting supermassive black hole will take three years to pass us to go from crest to trough, and uh, and that's. Uh, it'll, take, it'll go, in that time it will travel three light years, of course, which is about a quarter of the distance to Alpha Centauri. So you can imagine a node, like if you imagine the wave, it, it, uh, it's like a full node from us to Alpha Centauri, for this type of system. For the neutron star binaries, or for us compact stellar binaries, so we're talking about things that have a stellar mass, a few stellar masses, um, these systems will have a gravitational wave that uh, takes about three hours to pass, uh, and uh, the, the, the distance from crest to trough of those waves is, uh, what is that, 3 times 10 to the 9 kilometers, which is about the distance out to Neptune's orbit. So that wave that's coming through has the so size of our solar system. And if you have a merger situation where a neutron star and a, new <coughs> a black hole or a neutron star and a neutron star combine and they shoot out a gravitational wave, the gravitational wave that will come out of these is about 3,000 3, kilometers long. And, uh, and that's what, uh, again, what Ben will talk about next week, is uh, a system to look for these. So what, um, what, uh, you can use pulsars to detect. Indirectly, we can use pulsars to detect gravitational waves from this kind of system. Not because we actually see the wave, but we see the advance of periastron and we see the orbit decay and we infer the gravitational wave loss 
by using Einstein's theories, and 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 they, it all works. So it's it's um, uh, Einstein's theories to exactly predict the behavior of this, but this isn't actually seeing the way. They, they would consider this to be indirect detection. We we indirectly detect the gravitational wave because we think we see the thing spiraling down. However, we think with pulsars we can detect actually detect the gravitational wave from these orbiting supermassive black holes. So how you would use so LIGO, uh, which is a, an interferometer that Ben is going to talk about next week, that's hoping to detect a neutron star black, and black hole mergers. There was a project called LISA, and it's sort of, sort of a Frankenstein project. It was alive, and now it's dead. And, and now it's called the E-LISA, because the E stands for Europe because the Europeans are, are pushing it a bit, and that's going to maybe be, in you know, 20 years' time, uh, in space, or an orbiting uh, uh, triplet of satellites with laser beams, and it'll be bouncing the laser beams off and trying to see the gravitational wave sort of come through the solar system, and that will be looking for direct uh, emission from, uh, from these kinds of objects. But how do we detect this? So it's with, it's with pulsars, hopefully. So this is an artist cartoon, and and uh, and I because this is kind of the money shot in a way. Uh, this this kind of without even thinking about the details, this will kind of tell you what we're looking for. A gravitational wave is slowly passing. Well, not it's moving at the speed of light, but it rises so slowly and fall, like the the gradient of the rise and the gradient of the fall is so slow that it seems like it's slow even though it's going past at the speed of light. So you can imagine that the Earth, the Earth is just you know out in space, and this wave is slowly coming by, and over a period of you know three four years, it will slowly rock us in the direction of one of the pulsars and rock us away from one of the, from another. So we should see residuals showing up in our timing model, but the, but it isn't just going to be residuals in one; it's going to be residuals in in pairs, and they'll be correlated. If I am rocked to, to if if I'm rocked towards one of you guys, and the pulse from you arrives a little bit early, the pulse from your buddy who's over there will arrive a little bit late. So the, the residuals across different pulsars will be correlated. The only thing that can cause the system over there to correlate with the system over there is something that affects us, the thing in between. And so we're looking for a gravitational wave of coming. So now that I've said that, Okay, so it's, it should have awesome, you know, horns playing. Uh, so this is now uh, very rapidly sped up. This is not how fast it takes at all. It takes a lot longer for our two gravitational, supermassive black holes to orbit each other and radiate gravitational waves. The curvature of space-time just ripples outwards from them, and we have chosen it perfectly that the wave will emerge from the two systems and travel directly to Earth, uh, to our Milky Way, there it is. Uh, we have a ginormous telescope, wait to see this telescope, there it is. <laughs> <laughs> and we see the wave come between us and the pulsar, and it will gradually affect, as the waves go by, it will gradually affect Frequency. the propagation of these pulses. They will see all the uh, Space-time effects changing slightly because space-time is moving all that past it. I'm sure, frequency change is the biggest effect there, right? I, I think that was done more for, uh, for uh, visual... Uh, <coughs> I, I don't, we, we can talk about that. I, I want to wrap up. Okay. Um, so, behold, pulsar timing arrays. This is what people are doing now. We have, we're looking for more, but we have about a dozen or two dozen very well behaved uh, pulsars that uh, we have been timing for close to a decade, and we're continuing to time them. And as we time them, we're hoping to see this signature. And so the smoking gun signature uh, is something like this. So, so don't think about this too hard. It's kind of what I already said, but, but this is, uh, I just don't want you to think that it's sort of willy-nilly. We know exactly what to expect. So each one, so this is a simulation of what we would like to see.
So each one of these data points is a, a pair of pulsars. So I take my two favorite pulsars, and on the x-axis is the angular separation between them. So say this is so if I have a pulsar here and a pulsar here, they're 20 degrees apart. And so what you then say is, okay, if I have a residual in my timing model from number from from the first guy, and I have a residual from my timing model mm -hmm. in the second in, in this person, I multiply those residuals together. And so what's on this y-axis is sort of the multiplication of the residuals. <coughs> and sometimes the residuals go, uh, sometimes the residuals are not, they're not always positive, they can be negative. You can expect one, you can expect the pulse to arrive and it will arrive beforehand, or you can expect the pulse to arrive and it will arrive afterwards. So you can have negative and positive residuals. And so each pair, each pair of pulsars you have, on the x-axis you plot their angular separation, and on the y-axis, you plot the multiplication of the residuals. And if a gravitational wave has come by, this is the signature we should see. So we're not just out there looking for any old sort of, oh, this one flipped on Wednesday, and this one flipped up on Tuesday, and that, there we are, go, go down to Stockholm. No, no, we have a very clear uh, picture of how this should look. And so this is the best result that we have to date. So I guess there's about there's a dozen pulsars in here. Uh, those are the error bars, and those are the angular separation. The signal we want, never mind the green, the red, and, and blue lines, just look at the black data points. Those are the data points, each one for each, for the pair. And the, the dotted curve is the sort of shape we expect to see. And we, we don't see, there's no evidence for a shape that looks like that in, the, in the, these black dots. So we haven't detected it yet. But this is the best that we have, and as time goes on, and as we get more pulsars, and as we time the longer and longer, these error bars are going to shrink down, and hopefully we're going to see a curve that looks like that, and then we can go off to Stockholm. Mm -hmm. And so, so when, you have, uh, when you have this plot here, you can say, okay, what is the biggest curve that could be in here, and we don't see it, that's called making a limit, okay, we don't see one, but well, we can sort of cook, there's some sort of mathematics that help us determine, okay, we don't see one. So what is the largest one that could be in there that we don't see? And then we say, okay, that's, that's, we're at least below that level. And so we make an upper limit. So this is, this is an upper limit on this, so this doesn't make any sense unless I put it on this graph. So, so what I told you was that the size of the, of the waves that we expect to see versus their period so this measurement from our dozen pulsars that we have right now tells us that red line there. So whatever those spiraling supermassive black holes, if they're making gravitational waves, the strain from those waves has to be below this curve. So that's, that's where we're at right now. That's the best we can do. And uh, next week what uh, Ben is going to talk about is over on this side of the diagram, what, what, we, what we know on this side of the diagram. So just to wrap up, I'm, I'm finished. So I just those of you who have like uh, trains to catch or whatever, don't uh, hesitate to leave because I'm just going to show you the pulsar, uh, the, the telescopes that we use uh, in these pulsar timing arrays. So NanoGrav is a collaboration of the North American Nanohertz Observatory for Gravitational Waves, and that uses the Green Bank in uh, West Virginia and the, Ar the Arecibo Telescope in Puerto Rico. And uh, then there's the PPTA, which is the Parkes Pulsar Time Array. This is the Parkes Telescope in Australia. And then the Europeans have the European Pulsar Timing Array, and they use these uh, hmm. uh, telescopes. And so uh, basically the whole community is now coming on board, a big, uh, a big marriage of efforts to make the INSAR, INSAR, uh, International Pulsar Timing Array. We're going to use all these telescopes, combine all our data, so right now, the, the plots you saw with the 12 pulsars, that was only from the parks. So, you know, if they share their data with the Americans and the Europeans, then we have more pairs of pulsars, we can do a much tighter correlation. But uh, uh, there's still some bureaucracy and also some, uh, everybody has their own home recipe of how they analyze the pulsars, and so it's taking a little while to get my pulsar data to work with your pulsar analysis and so on. So this is all getting ironed out. But Yes, it, uh, as we go forward, we have much more data, uh, much better data, because we're going to be able to use pairs of pulsars that we had before, and hopefully we're going to detect a gravitational wave. And you can help. 
Um, so this, analyzing all this pulsar data takes a, I put the slide up before, but analyzing this pulsar data takes a lot of computing resources. And if you go here to this place, Einstein.home, Einstein.home.org, you, uh, you can volunteer your computing resources to this project. So when your computer is just sitting there and you're not using it, uh, the a little program will start and will start cranking the numbers. And the nice thing about this, uh, as, I, as I said before, if your computer is used to detect a new pulsar, then you, your name will be mentioned in the publication. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so that's a bit of advertisement. And so this is uh, where we've been. This is where we're going next week. Ben Farr will be here. And uh, thank you all. how much energy is carried away and whatever in these quadrupole oscillations is sort of complicated. And so I was just wondering whether or not you could pick out a dominant thing like that, that was, that you could say the energy is in this, the amplitude, the frequency. Yeah, the, I, I'm going to leave that sort of stuff for Ben next week. He's much more of the gravitational wave expert. So okay. uh, I don't think I wouldn't try to, try to get in there with that. Now, sir. You, we had, what, what was it? Okay. Uh, I have a problem with your oh. claiming on the uh, electron densities. You said there's an average. Unfortunately, I can draw the analogy of a river with an average 
Yeah, <laughs> I guarantee you can ground it. Um, with, with this being so critical for the timing measurements, and I would believe that most of the electron densities are quite zonal and quite variable and have energies involved that are, I'm sure, not completely understood. And I can see that the variability and the error bars that you show seem to support what I'm saying. How do you bypass this or so the electron so the electron so the dispersion stuff is isn't this isn't a problem because it's it's we can measure it directly. It's one of the things in the timing model, and we measure it by having two wavelengths. If you have two wavelengths, you just can measure it. Of course, if you have. I mean. Uh, you want to have a wide, the widest band you can and the best sampling. So you know, if you have 50 channels across two gigahertz, you can take that dispersion out uh, incredibly well because it, how it how it delays a, a 10 mega, a 100 megahertz photon, and how it delays a 200 megahertz photon, that's incredibly well understood. And so you you can you can take that out. What I was alluding to was more if you have. Um, if you have like a, a binary system where you, you have the pulsar wind, uh, not the pulsar wind, sorry, the wind from the companion. Yeah. If the wind from the companion interacts with the neutron star, like it can interact, they're, they're, it can give momentum, it can cause drag, it can cause a lot of like uh, like mechanical effects in the binary. Irregularities. Yeah, and, and so those are the kinds of situations that. Um, that uh, make a bad timing model if you have that kind of situation. And so those, so far we haven't been able to use those kinds of sources, and there are, there are lots of them, but right now we're <laughs> unsure about how they would affect the gravitational wave signal, so we don't, we don't allow them in the analysis. Thank you. You said the gravitational waves travel at the speed of light? Correct. Is that only in a vacuum? Is it slowed by the medium it passes through? I, I do not think it cares about the vacuum. So yeah, I, I, I think for a gravitational wave, it is not uh, it is it is not related to matter at all. Uh, I mean, it's not uh, it's not the speed is not dependent on the local matter density. Question. All right, all right, yes, sir. Do you, in your delay corrections, do you take account of the solar system's motion through the galaxy? That's a very very good question. And the solar system motion through the galaxy is a velocity term. It's not an acceleration term. And so that doesn't affect things. If, if we have, if there's a constant, if there's a constant speed difference between the solar system barycenter and the barycenter of the orbiting system, that constant speed difference, you can't see that. So the timing model monitoring you know, the, it uh, detects the gravitational wave. But aren't gravitational waves ubiquitous? Uh, and how how isn't there interference? Uh, so and how do you how so, do you detect I mean what's So the okay, okay, okay. So so um so yeah, you, you're right. You're right, and, and you, it's an important point, and it's one I didn't talk about, and I debated whether I would talk about it or not. So the, the thing is that the story I told you, I always tell you a lie. You see, I always tell you, I always tell you a little white lie to help everybody get on board. There is not one supermassive black hole binary out there with one way it comes out and bobs us up and bobs us down. We are sitting on an ocean of gravitational waves. There isn't just one. Now, for the merger situation, which Ben's going to talk about next week, where you have like, that's like a tsunami. Something has happened, a big wave has happened. It's not an ambient wave. It's not the ambient waves caused by the, the general spiraling of masses around each other at various parts of the galaxy. Something has happened. Two things have crashed together. Big wave comes out and goes through. And so for the, the story of a wave going by, like one wave going by, that's really only important for the merger situation because that is like going to dominate the scenario. 
Most of the time, when that wave isn't going by, we're just bobbing up and down on a sea of gravitational waves. And so the signature I showed of the correlation, that's the correlation you expect for what's called the stochastic gravitational wave background, which is basically the, the sea of waves that we're bobbing up and down on. And yes, so that's a very perceptive thing to say. Yes, uh, we're not going to just, unless we have like an impulsive event, like a, like a, and you know, uh, the pulsar timing isn't sensitive to that, but LIGO, uh, which is, go, which is uh, Ben's going to talk about, that is sensitive to more impulsive type waves going by. And so then, then we can even point to them, like hopefully when the wave goes by, we'll even be able to say, oh, it came from that direction and stuff, whereas uh, this, uh, this bobbing up and down signature, we, we won't be able to tell exactly where they're coming from. Now I'm going to take two more questions. And that's going to be it. So, sir, go ahead. So, um, oh, no, you're reading the handout. <laughs> your, well, you've got your graphics, too. But the, it's a typical graph paper kind of graphics to show the illustration of the, mm -hmm. the concept of the gravitational waves. And what I'm, uh, I've always been unclear on is, so these seem to be like, uh, we, we could consider them imaginary lines that uh, define, let's say, the path that light will take. Um, and, but if there is something real about them, they have to be more than imaginary. It seems like if they have to be some feature of space that gets moved. Um, and the question I've always had is, what is that feature of space? Here, for example, it looks like a pudding that got pushed out of the way. Uh, and so it's like denser somewhere. It is, somewhere it's, it's the, so I don't know, I, I don't know how to put the gravitational waves themselves in a box since, you know what I mean? Like, like the, the, the reference frame and the thing we're talking about are one and the same thing in a way, like, like space has a, has like, uh, this is a parallel path. Back up, back up, back up. I don't know how to answer your question. Okay. I, I, it's a, it's a, it's a, is, is it a bum question? No, I, I don't think it is a bum question. But it points to the fact that I haven't got like a fully, like I, that's the kind of question I feel like you need to have really condensed the material. Like you really need to have, have absorbed the material really well in order to be able to sort of bring out a nuance like that and illustrate it. And I, I can't do it justice. I, I mean, I, I can repeat the same phrase as that. Like, exactly what you said is a, like, that the, the, how light should move, how light should move, there's a ripple in that, in that description of how light should move. Because the mass that tells space-time how to curve has, has created that curve, and that curve tells light how to move, and that curve is moving. And so the graph paper is moving, but what is the graph paper moving in? Is <laughs> like because well, one thing. So there, there is one concept of the graviton, which is like the electromagnetic equivalent. So we, we think of the electric field and the magnetic field as being uh, informed by the photon. Photon is the thing that does the work. That's the electromagnetic wave that does the work. We, so people who try to do quantum gravity, now that's not, that's not Einstein didn't do that, but people who do quantum gravity call it the graviton, and it's like a, uh, it's, it's the solution to your question, but I don't know if that's super mainstream, and I, I'm not very comfortable describing much more about, other than the fact that there's a now now share the graviton, and people have, people answer your question with that sometimes. Maybe there's other answers to the question, but I don't, I don't all right, I have one more question. My scares is off. All right, well then, thank you very much.